I'd like to welcome all of you to our class A, B, C again. We have finished eight books of the Bible thus far. Today we are on the ninth book of the Bible, which is the book of First Samuel. I'm going to read two verses. It is found in First Samuel chapter 1, verse 20. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, meaning because I have asked for him from the Lord. Shall we pray? Dear God, we want to pray for your richest blessing to rest upon your word today. May you bless our time as we study your word. Anoint your servant, anoint your people. We ask in Jesus' mighty and great name. Amen and Amen. Do you know in the original language of the Hebrew Bible, the first and the second Samuel are actually one book. So it's also first and second Kings, and also first and second Chronicle. These books were divided by the scholars in olden days because they translated the Old Testament from the Hebrew language to the Greek language. The reason they did it is because 1st and 2nd Samuel were too long to fit into one scroll. And this is why they break it up into two scrolls so that it is easier to handle and easier to read. How are we going to approach this book today? We can do it in a number of ways. Firstly, we can approach the book geographically. There are four main places which we must get acquainted with if we want to study this book well. The first is called Shiloh. This is found in chapter 1 verse 3. The meaning of Shiloh means peace. This is why Elkanah, taking his two wives, Penina and Hannah, in chapter 1 verse 3, they went to Shiloh to worship and make sacrifices to God there. Why? Because the tabernacle was situated right in Shiloh itself. The second place which we need to be acquainted with is called Bethlehem. This is found in chapter 16, verse 4. This was the birthplace of David. And this was also the birthplace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The name Bethlehem means house of bread. The third place we need to be acquainted with it's called Jerusalem. This is found in chapter 17, verse 54, and also 2 Samuel, chapter 5, and verse 5. Jerusalem was the place where David was anointed as king over all the 12 tribes of Israel. The meaning of the name Jerusalem means the city of peace. Now, when you look at Jerusalem today, it seems like there is no peace at the moment in Israel. Am I right? But one day it will, only when the prince of peace return to this earth the second time to be king over Israel, then there will be peace in Jerusalem there will be peace in Israel as well as peace in this world. The last place which we need 
to take note of is called Hebron. This is found in chapter 30, verse 31, and also 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, and verse 11. What is all about Hebron? Hebron was the capital city of David. The name Hebron also means friendship. So, we have looked into this book geographically. Now, secondly, we want to approach this book historically. Based on 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says here, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And since we know that God created this world in seven days, so the timeline of God for the whole human race on earth is only 7,000 years period with one day to a thousand. So the whole human race starting right from creation to the end of the earth can be divided into four main sections each. Starting number one, from Adam to Abraham, is actually 2,000 years. From Abraham to the first coming of Christ is another 2,000 years. And right in this section of time, it can again be divided into four main sections, namely, number one, Israel, led by the patriarch, from 2000 BC to 1500 BC, that is from Abraham to Joseph. Then Israel, led by the prophets, from 1500 BC to 1000 BC, that is from Moses to Samuel. Then number three, Israel, led by the kings, 1000 BC, to 500 BC, from King Saul onwards. Then number four, Israel led by the priests, from 500 BC to 3 BC. This is where you come across the name of Ezra, Joshua, Zerubbabel, etc. and etc. Then not only we see from Adam to Abraham, from Abraham to the first coming of Christ, now number three, from Christ's first coming to Christ's second coming, there's another 2,000 years, which we call it the church age. And that is from the period of AD 1 right up to our present age, 2020 AD and beyond. Then the last stage, of it all is the 1,000 years, which we call it the 1,000 years of millennium rule of Christ. So from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years. From Abraham to the first coming of Christ, another 2,000 years. Then from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ is another 2,000 years that left only the last 1,000 years, which we call it the 1,000 years millennium rule of Christ. So, we have seen how we approach this book geographically, historically. Now, thirdly, we want to approach this book spiritually. This book serves as a transition period between the rule of God, that is theocracy, to the rule of of human kings, which we call monarchy. So by the time we come to 1 Samuel, the rule of God was about to come to an end. That is the long period under the rule of the 12 judges. Now it's going to come to the rule of human kings, and which we call monarchy. Now, the rejection 
of God to rule over Israel and demanding a human king is all can be seen in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4 to verse 7. This is what the people of Israel said to Samuel. And it says here, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, verse 5, and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us, like all the nation, verse 6. But the thing displeases Samuel when they say, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, he to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. That's what God said, that I should not reign over them. So in 1 Samuel, there's a rejection of God's rule, theocracy over their life and demanding for a human king monarchy to be over their life. So we have approached his book geographically, historically, spiritually. Now, fourthly, we want to approach this book biographically. This means we need to look at this book. There are five main characters that spring up out from this book. The first one is called Hannah, second Eli, the third is called Samuel, then King Saul, then King David. Now bear in mind, all these five names, all interwoven with each other, overlapping, interconnected with one another. For example, the story of Hannah is interwoven into the life of Eli, the life of Eli is interwoven into the life of Samuel, and the life of Samuel is interwoven into the life of Saul, and the story of Saul is interwoven into the life of David, and so on and so forth until we come to the end of this book itself. So we approach this book geographically, historically, spiritually, biographically, then lastly, we can approach this book segmentally, segmentally, S-E-G-M-E-N-T-A-L-L-Y. Now, we can easily divide this book under two points. Number one, the decline of judges. Number two, the demand for kings. So let us take the first point first, which is the decline of judges. And this takes us from chapter 1 to chapter 7. Under this point, there are three main characters that we need to look into right here. Number 1 is Hannah. Number 2 is Eli. Number 3 is Samuel. First and foremost, let us look at the life of Hannah. I will call her Hannah, number one, a prayerful mother. Chapter one and chapter two. The name Hannah simply means grace or gracious. We see Hannah's praying in chapter one. Number two, we see Hannah's praising. Chapter two, verse one to verse ten. So we have seen Hannah's a prayerful mother. Now, secondly, let us look at Eli, a careless father, a careless father, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now, under this point, we will see three main failures of Eli's life as a careless father, which we must not emulate. Number one, his failure in watching over his kids. Bear in mind that kids, children, are given to us as gifts from the Lord, as mentioned in Psalms 127 verse 3. Therefore, we need to treasure our kids properly. Do not forget to watch over them in all areas of their life. Don't let our busyness in our job, in our business, in our service to God, rob us of our time with them. 
don't ever, ever be an absentee father or a negligent father or an irresponsible father. Don't be like Eli who neglect his children. Your job as Christian parents is to teach your children. If they don't turn out well in the end, never, never put the blame on the pastor or even the church or even the Sunday school teachers. For God's word teaches us as parents that we need to take time to teach our children at home at their very young age. This is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 to 9. God said, You shall teach them diligently. Who's supposed to teach them? You. You shall teach them diligently, wholeheartedly to your children. Remember, it's your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the top posts of your house and on your gate. This is also mentioned in Proverbs 22 verse 6. Train up. So there's a training involved. Train up. You train them up. You see it? It says here, train up a child in the way. Only one way. The way he should go. The one way is God. So that when he's old, the Bible says, he will not depart from it. Now see what happened when Eli didn't take time to teach and to instruct his children. What happened? The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, Now the sons of Eli, even though they were the children of a priest, guess what happened? The Bible says they were corrupt and they did not know the Lord. Now that is a very, very sad commentary when you read about Eli's children. So we have seen Eli, his failure in watching over his kids. Number two, you see the second failure of Eli. And what was that? His failure in whipping or in disciplining his kids. We all know what the Bible says concerning child discipline in the home. Learn to discipline your kids early in life. If not, they will bring shame and heartache to your life in your later days. In Proverbs 29 verse 15 says, The rod and rebuke gives wisdom. But a child left to himself, that means do whatever they want, he will bring shame to his mother. Proverbs 29 verse 17, Discipline your son, and he will give you rest, and he will bring delight to your heart. Now, I don't believe in brutality when it comes to disciplining your kids, because the Bible advises in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 18, Discipline your son while there's still hope. But do not set your heart in putting them to death. And that is called brutality. I don't believe that. Now, Bible speaks of what? The Bible also speaks on the effectiveness of discipline in the home. Effectiveness of discipline in the home. It says in Proverbs 23 verse 14, If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from hell. Again in Proverbs 20 verse 30, Blows that wound, cleanse away evil. Can you see that? Stroke, make clean. 
the innermost parts. Also read Proverbs 6, verse 23, it says, For the commandment is a lamp, teaching is a light, and the reproof of discipline are the way of life. Here, can you see? Coupled with discipline, remember you must bring in God's word and advice. Now look at what happened to Eli's kids because of the lack of discipline at home. This is mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 13 to 16. They were misbehaving themselves right in the temple, right before God's people. So if you are free, please read them. So much so, we have seen Eli's failure in watching over his kids and also his failure in whipping his kids. Now, thirdly, we want to see his failure in warning his kids. Look at what they did to the worshippers. They come to the tabernacle to worship. The Bible says that they were committing sexual sin with those worshippers in broad daylight, right in front of the tabernacle. This is mentioned in chapter 2, verse 22. Now Eli was very old and he heard everything his son did to all Israel, not to some, to all Israel, and how they lay with the woman who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now that is disgusting. That is disgracing. What did Eli actually do in the end? The Bible says he only tell them what they did was not right. That's all. But you know what Mosaic law says concerning this kind of action? If they sin against God right in front of the tabernacle, what did the Bible say in Leviticus 20 verse 10? By right, they'll be stoned to death, both the adulterer and the adulteresses. They shall be put to death. But what did Eli do? No, he didn't do anything. He was indifferent. He was showing partiality to his own two sons instead of abiding to God's law. So what did God do in the end? He allowed his two sons, Hobni and Phinehas, to be killed right in the battle. You can read that in chapter 4, verse 11. So we have seen Hannah, a prayerful mother, Eli, a careless father. Now we want to see Samuel, a godly priest. Chapter 4 and chapter 7. So first we see Samuel, the boy in chapter 2. At a very young age, you can see that Samuel had a heart for God, had a heart to minister to God. This is found in chapter 2, verse 11, and also chapter 2, verse 26. And because of that, God's hand was upon his life. And the Bible says the child, Samuel, grew in wisdom and in favor both with God, that's very important, both with God, God must come first, then also have favor with men. Chapter 2, verse 26. So we've seen Samuel the boy, now we see Samuel the prophet, the whole of chapter 3. And chapter 3, verse 19 says, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And notice, he did not let any of God's word fall to the ground. Samuel grew. Yes, it is important for our children to be healthy and strong and growing physically, but more so, we must make sure they are doing well spiritually, that they will love God's word each day of their life. And this is what we see in the life of Samuel the prophet. And no wonder, because of his love for God, what did God do? God chose him to be a prophet, in chapter 3, verse 20, it says, And all Israel from then to Bathsheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then means the north, Bathsheba means the south. So from north to south, all of them recognized God's calling over Samuel's life as a prophet to the nation. So we're seeing Samuel, the boy, Samuel, the prophet, now we see Samuel, the judge. In chapter 7, 
verse 15 to verse 17. You can see Samuel functioning as a judge in Israel. So we have seen the decline of the judges. That's point number one. Now we are tackling point number two, the last point, the demand for kings. Chapter 8 to chapter 31. Now over here, from chapter 8 to chapter 31, we're going to see only two kings. First was King Saul. That was man's choice. Then the other was King David. That is God's choice. And then we'll come to the end of the book and that's, we, and that's where we end the study of First Samuel. So first of all, King Saul, chapter 8 to chapter 15. Now, first of all, we can see Saul's initial devotion. Chapter 9 to chapter 10. Chapter 9 to chapter 10. We see that he began very well at first. Number one, you see his choice as king, chapter 9. Number two, we see his anointing as king, that's chapter 10. So we have seen Saul's initial devotion. Now, secondly, we want to see Saul's gradual decline. Not only devotion, but now gradual decline. Chapter 13 to chapter 15. Over here, we see few shortcomings in Saul's life. The first shortcoming concerning his life was his impatience. You can see that in chapter 13. Can you recall what Samuel said to him in chapter 10 verse 8? Samuel told Saul to wait for him for seven days. Seven days. Wait for seven days till he come to make sacrifices of peace offering. You know what was Saul's problem? He couldn't wait. He was impatient. He waited until the seventh day. Then when Samuel did not appear, he couldn't wait anymore. Then he went ahead and made the sacrifices. So when Samuel appeared on the scene, what did Samuel say to him? In chapter 13, Verse 11 and 12, Samuel said to him, Samuel said to him, what have you done? And Saul said, because I've seen the people scattering away from me. And since you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistine gathered together at Mishmash, then I say the Philistine will now come down on me at Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offer a burnt offering. Can you see that act of impatience that was found in Saul's life? And as a result, Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly in chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, which he commanded you, verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue, and the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. So we have seen Saul's impatience. Number two, the second area of shortcoming was his insubmission, chapter 15. His problem is very simple. He cannot submit. Not only he don't have patience, he also cannot submit both to God and to man. Remember what Samuel said to him? Wait for me for seven days. Did he do it? No. And God told him, what did God tell him? God told him concerning the Amalekites, you remember? God said, kill all. Don't spare anything. Am I right? What did he do? In chapter 15 verse 9, he spared the king and the best of the sheep. In chapter 15, verse 10 and verse 11, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I set Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And he grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Now look at the scene. After God talked to Samuel, Samuel came to the scene, 
and he came to find Saul. Look at the different, different things that surfaced right in Saul's life. Number one, it was his pride. It says here in chapter 15, verse 12, when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told to Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed, he set up a monument, set up a monument for who? For himself. Look at him. That is called pride. Instead of rendering that victory over the Amalekites to the Lord, he took the glory all to himself. In short, he was proud. He wasn't like in the beginning. He was timid in the very beginning. He was humbled at the very first. You can read that in chapter 9, verse 21, and chapter 10, verse 22. But now, pride has creeped into his heart and life. People of God, be very, very careful of pride. So the first problem of Saul was his pride. Number two, his pretense. Look at Saul. When Samuel came to him, what did he say to Samuel? Chapter 15, verse 13 says, Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. He pretended as if like nothing has happened. That's called pretense. And some people are very good at pretending. Uh, and that is what we see in the life of Saul. The third problem, not only his pride, his pretense. Number three, he's lying. Chapter 15, verse 13, Saul said to him, I have performed, look at the word, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Was it true? The answer is absolutely not. God said, Saul did not perform all that I asked him to do. And yet he can say, I have performed all the commandments of the Lord. That is actually a plain lie. So number four, his problem, the fourth problem was his blame shifting. You can see that in chapter 15, verse 14 and verse 15. Then Samuel asked Saul, then how come, if you have done everything, how come I'm still hearing the bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said straight away, Oh, that, that, that sound, that bleating, that lowing of the oxen, is all because of the people. Verse 15 say, They, the people, are the one who brought them from the Amalekites. And they say, For the people spare the best of the sheep and the auction to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Can you see? He blamed it all on the people. That's called blame shifting. He don't want to admit his own mistake. He blamed it on others. His fifth problem was his godlessness. This is found in chapter 15, verse 15. He says, to sacrifice to the Lord. Look at the word. Your God. How come Saul never say, my God? Sacrifice. You know, to sacrifice to the Lord, my God, he can say that. But he says, to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, as if like God was not his God at all. Can you see how he fell spiritually? How he declined spiritually? That was his godlessness. The sixth problem was his stubbornness. When corrected by Samuel, he still insisted that he was right, that he obeyed God. You can read that in chapter 15, verse 20. In fact, he argued his way out. And what did he say to Samuel? He said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord has sent me. Can you see his stubbornness right here? Stubborn people usually don't admit their own mistake when they are wrong. They will try to argue their way out. See, stubbornness is a sin. And the last problem of Saul was his disobedience. You can see that in chapter 15, verse 22, 23, Samuel said, Has the Lord 
a great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So the next thing Samuel did was in chapter 15, verse 32 and verse 33, he asked Agar to be brought to him. And he hacked, he hacked Agar into pieces before the Lord. In other words, Samuel completed what Saul had left off. He finished the job what Saul couldn't finish. Then in chapter 15, verse 35, Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. So we see Saul's initial devotion, Saul's gradual decline. Now we see Saul's eventual death. You can read about his death in chapter 31, verse 6. So we've learned about King Saul's life. Now in this last section, we want to study on King David's life, chapter 16 to chapter 31. So firstly, we want to see David as a shepherd, chapter 16. We all know that David started off as a what? As a shepherd boy, tending his father's sheep. We also know that he was anointed by Samuel as king in chapter 16, verse 13. So he began as a nobody. Nobody even notices him, not even his own brothers, and no need to say about his father. But God notices him. And that was how David began his life. He began his life as a shepherd. He began very well, and he also ended very well. You can read that in First Chronicle chapter 29. And verse 28, it says here, So he, that, that is David, died in the good old age, full of years and riches and honor, and Solomon his son reigned in his place. So first we have seen David as a shepherd. Now we want to see David as a harpist in chapter 16. Here we see David was a gifted musician. You can see in chapter 16, verse 18, the servant said concerning David, who was skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, handsome, and the Lord was with him. Look at what he did in chapter 16, verse 23. Whenever the evil spirit came upon Saul, and when David begins to play his harp, what happened? Saul was refreshed and the distressing spirit went away from him. That's how powerful music is. If you are gifted in music, if you are a musician in the church, remember God has entrusted into your hand a powerful gift. If you use it well, if you under the dictation of the Spirit of God and in the Spirit of God anointed you, the music that you play, let me tell you, it will be a powerful weapon to release souls and to bring healings to life. Use it well for the glory of God. So David was a shepherd, David as a harpist. Then number three, we want to see David as a warrior, chapter 17. Remember how he slay Goliath? Nobody dared to take on this great giant. All were afraid. Not even his brothers, not even King Saul, not even the soldiers. But David took only one stone and took care of that giant that day. You can read that in chapter 17, verse 50. With a stone, with a sling, he struck the Philistine and killed him right there. So you can see the true spirit of a warrior. He was fierceless. And this is what I call a full-fledged warrior. He wasn't afraid to confront that giant. So we've seen David as a shepherd, David 
a harpist, David as a warrior, number four, David as a commander. You can see that in chapter 18, verse 13, verse 14, King Saul make him to be the captain of his army. Now, lastly, we want to see David as a fugitive. Chapter 20 to chapter 31. Altogether, about 11 chapters. We see the middle part of David's life. He was chased by King Saul as a fugitive, as an outlaw, and as a rebel in Saul's eye. All because of what? All because of the name of jealousy. So day and night, King Saul was hunting for David's life. He wants to kill him. You can read that in chapter 24, verse 2, and also chapter 26, verse 2. But the beautiful part of this story is this. God was overseeing it all. He did not give David into Saul's hand. And no matter what Saul did, David's life was spared. Can you see the perfect control of God over David's life? And so also God's perfect control over our life as well. In chapter 23, verse 14, look at what God's word say concerning David's life. And David stayed in the stronghold in the wilderness and remained in the mountain of the wilderness of Zip. Saul sought him. Look at the word. Every day, every day, without fail, from morning till night, Saul was hunting for his life. Saul wanted to kill David. But chapter 23, verse 14 says, but God, but God, thank God, God stands in the way between Saul and David. He was right in the middle. But God did not deliver David into his hand. Can you see God's protection over David's life? It's amazing, isn't it? Yes, every day of a life, remember God's protection is over us, against the devil, against the enemies of our soul, be it in our neighborhood, be it at work. Remember, God's protection is very, very important. Now let's look at First Chronicle chapter 18, verse 6 and verse 13, and let's see what it says here. So the Lord preserved David. Wherever he went, verse 13, he also put garrison in Edom and all Edomites became David's servant. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. Can you see the double emphasis right here? Amen. Can you see God's protection over David's life? Now, let me ask you, can you trust God's protection over your life as well? Can the good Lord Take good care of us, and especially in this coronavirus pandemic. What's the answer? The answer, of course, he will. Yes, he will take good care of us all. All God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. May his grace and peace be with you all. Amen.